Hi, this is Professor K. Hanlust. This is another lecture in History 1301, United States History 2, 1877. We are very nearly at the end. Today is Lecture 18, The Civil War, Sectionalism and Civil War to be precise. No other conflict took as many lives or had as many consequences for the United States as the Civil War. It fundamentally altered the course of American history and transformed the United States into a modern nation, a different type of nation. This is why some historians refer to it as the second American Revolution. In one sense, the Civil, the Civil War marks the final triumph of Alexander Hamilton's ideas about the United States over those of Thomas Jefferson. Much of United States' history has been about what kind of a nation we should be. What kind of a nation should the U.S. be? Should it be an agrarian type of nation? Should it be an industrial type of nation? Should it be a nation of farms or a nation of cities? Should it be a nation of slave labor or a nation based on free labor? What should the role of the national government be? Should it be a strong centralized government with authority that emanates from the top? Or should states' rights be the central basis for the national government. So the Civil War is unquestionably a watershed moment. It transforms the United States into the United States that we recognize today. So why does the Civil War happen? There are four processes in getting us to that point. The first is a growing disparity between northern and southern economic systems and societies. Recall that when the country was founded, slavery was a national institution. It was practiced in every single state. Every religious group supported it. Every part of this country, every state was agrarian in nature at the start. But slavery was marginalizing in the North, and after the Revolutionary War was over, it basically ceased to exist. Not literally ceased to exist. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but it is becoming less and less the norm in the North. The Northern economy diversified. It began to rest more and more on wage labor in a commercially oriented, industrialized economy. Now, if you remember also during that same period, though, the invention of the cotton gin and a cotton boom occurred, and this tied those northern manufacturers to the, the institution of slavery. Now, the South, by contrast, remained rural. It remained, remained agrarian. It was dependent on slave labor as opposed to free labor. So the North and the South, again, have, de have developed along diverging lines over the course of time. And the result is that slavery becomes the symbol of two different ways of life in the United States, two different visions about what the United States should be. Sorry, we're too early on that one. The North increasingly saw itself as a society based on freedoms and on progress, and the increasing number of slaves in this country was in was in contrast to their idea about what this country ought to be. Process number two is the war with Mexico. This war is going to force the country to decide, will slavery be part of the national expansion or not? Over the course of the post-war with Mexico era, congressmen are going to attack each other in the halls of Congress. They will draw weapons on each other. The vice president at one point will preside over the Senate with a pistol in his desk, just in case. We talked in the last lecture about Charles Sumner and his, uh, and his being attacked by Preston Brooks in the Senate. Guerrilla warfare breaking out in Kansas. And then we also see a sectional party developing, the Republican Party, that's developing over this question, do we allow slavery to be part of the expansion or not? In 1860, Abraham Lincoln is going to be elected without a single electoral vote from the South. And the South knew what this meant. This process comes to its full high point when 
the South realizes a president can be elected over their objection, without their influence. The South decided because of all of this, their way of life is threatened and they had no choice. They must secede from the Union. Process number three in all of this is the breakdown of the American political system. As long as the political parties were strong, as long as we have two basic parties that are getting together and compromising everything away, slavery could be compromised away. But as we saw, starting in the 1830s and really exploding in the 40s and 50s, we see a massive influx of immigrants from Ireland and from Germany changing and weakening the system. The system is not able to contain this dissent as the uh, the Whig Party goes away, the Know Nothing Party replaces them, and then the Know Nothings go away. It's Im almost impossible to compromise with this type of influx and with this type of chaos. As a consequence, the system is unable to compromise the issue of slavery away. And then the fourth process. The fourth process is a growing nationalism on the part of the North. A growing number of people in the North were convinced that if a state could leave simply because they don't like who got elected, then the whole idea of democracy is done. We should just do away with the whole thing because our experiment is over. If a member state can leave, Republican democracy does not exist. And the North became attacked, attached, excuse me, attached to this idea that we will not allow this. We're not going to allow one. We're not going to allow five. We're not going to allow 11. We're not going to allow 15 states to leave the Union. And Abraham Lincoln is going to stake his presidency on this notion. And when he does, millions of people are going to be willing to die for all of this. Now, actions are going to be the key in all of this. And you can see on the map how, uh, how divided the country is. We'll see this map again, but Abraham Lincoln does not win a single electoral vote from the South. And you can see that what this map, this is a very much divided political map, but it's actions that push us as a nation to this division in 1860. Now, the big action is going to be led by John Brown, the same John Brown who in the last lecture had stood up in the back of that church in Massachusetts and swore to use all of his power to end slavery in this country. He wanted to raid the South. He had already gone to Kansas with the idea of stopping slavery. Now he has a new idea. He's going to raid the South and free enslaved people, get them into the Appalachian Mountains and lead them into free territory. Now, he understood that this plan might not work and that there were big time problems with it, that if he got these enslaved people to the north, it didn't literally mean that they're free because the Fugitive Slave Act could have caused real problems with this. But Douglas, excuse me, Brown knows that if he does this and leads these people northward, it will create a crisis. It will force people to stand up once and for all and say, you're either on one side of the slavery issue or the other side of the slavery issue. And this is a risk he's willing to take. Now, he, for a number of years, right after, 18, right after he leaves Kansas, he begins working on people, prominent abolitionists, to raise funds, to get equipment together, to raise an army to do this. He talks to Frederick Douglass and offers Douglass command of this army that would raid the South. Uh, now, Douglass turns him down, uh, conv convinced that this was a suicide mission, but Douglass was sympathetic to what Brown was trying to do and worked to actually raise funds and raise equipment for Brown and in his endeavor. Finally, in October of 1859, Brown believed he was ready, and he and his followers attacked a place called Harper's Ferry in Virginia. Uh, today, Harper's Ferry is in West Virginia, but West Virginia didn't exist at this point. He and his 
group attack this federal army where the United States stored many much of its weaponry uh, headed for the south. And the plan at Harper's Ferry is very simple. It's not a it's not this sort of plan of budding genius. The plan is attack the armory, steal the weapons, distribute them to the enslaved people, and lead an army of liberation out of the South. Things went wrong almost immediately at Harper's Ferry. Uh, a guard, on, a civilian guard on duty, ironically enough, an Af- a free black person, had uh, had gotten killed. Brown's men fired uh, fired on him and killed him. Uh, and this is the first sort of casualty uh, in the Civil War for many people. Uh, by the time Brown and his men did actually capture the arsenal, the word had already gotten out that an insurrection was taking place. All escape routes were blocked. The federal government got involved. The uh, Secretary of War uh, wound up sending Robert E. Lee, who at the time was an artillery colonel, uh, and they put him in charge of a detachment of Marines and sent them in uh, to put down this rebellion. Uh, the insurrection gets put down almost immediately with uh, Brown being trapped inside the armory with his sons. Now, many of Brown's men actually escaped, but Brown refused to leave, citing that his sons uh, were all either killed or wounded, uh, and he refused to leave, and ultimately uh, he's taken prisoner. His last son finally dies, uh, and when his last son died, that's when Brown finally surrenders. So this is a lot of noise, uh, make no mistake about that, but in the end it doesn't do what Brown is intending it to do. What winds up happening here is that Brown is now going to go to trial. But even within that, while it's clear Brown is going to go to trial, it's not clear what he's going to go to trial for or where he's going to go to trial. Now, it seemed obvious that he attacked a federal armory, so it's a federal crime. So he's going to stand trial by the federal government. But ultimately, the federal government ceded jurisdiction, as we're going to see, and decided we're not going to try him. We're going to leave it to the state to try him. John Brown's attorneys wanted him to plead insanity. They wanted him to be examined and have him declared incapable of standing trial, but Brown flatly refused to participate in things. He came out and said very early on, I know what I did. I know what I'm doing. I didn't have, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm aware of the circumstances. Uh, and he said he just would not cooperate under any circumstances if insanity were part of the bargain. So what eventually winds up happening, uh, courtesy of their lobbying for it, is the state of Virginia winds up getting jurisdiction. And he's tried in Jefferson County Court, which is where uh, Harper's Ferry was, or is. He's he's tried in Jefferson County Courts for, quote, treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, when Brown goes on trial, uh, as you should have read in the document, Brown does not deny anything that he did. He flat out claimed, I did it. He says, there's no doubt about what I did. Uh, He said that the only thing that uh, that was wrong in what he did was that he did it on the behalf of slaves and said that if he had done it on behalf of the poor or any, or if he had done it on behalf of the wealthy, that they would have hailed him as a hero. Um, he says, quote, the evils of this nation will never be purged without blood, which turns him into a freedom fighter, as many people in the North saw it, and turns him into a martyr. Um, now, he also had his reaction to the guilty verdict published, and it was widely considered to be brilliant. It's part of the document that you read. He wrote, quote, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. All of this transformed his trial into an assault on slavery, which was exactly what Brown was hoping to do with the insurgency. So it worked better than he could ever have imagined. Uh, He equated himself as a prophet who had been willing to give his life 
for the end of slavery. So all along the the north on his execution day, uh, black bunting went up uh, in public spaces, bells tolled, signaling that a martyr was being executed. So Brown had transformed slavery, as he always intended to, into this inescapable moral issue and convinced many people that slavery had to be ended now. Now, many politicians tried to take the uh, what we would today refer to as the politically correct route uh, and argue that uh, John Brown had done something that was wrong, even as sympathetic as they may be with his cause. He did something wrong. For example, Abraham Lincoln said that John Brown was, quote, a dangerous, misguided fanatic. However, a lot of Southerners weren't buying that. One actually said that the only reason Northerners opposed what John Brown was doing was because he had failed. If he had been successful, they argued, then Northerners would have hailed his, quote, accomplishment. What Brown's raid convinces Southerners of in the end, in 1859, is that it is now clear there is no compromise left. Northerners will stop at nothing to destroy Southern society and Southern institutions. So the Civil War, in their, from their perspective, it's inevitable. It's going to happen no matter what. Now, when the 1860 election happens, the Democrats held their nominating convention, and most people expected that Stephen Douglas, same Stephen Douglas from the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas and Nebraska Act, virtually everybody expected that he would be the candidate for the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party had and still has a rule that for the nomination to go to a candidate, that candidate has to get two-thirds of the delegates' support. And Douglas simply could not get it. So the Democrats tried and tried and tried and finally said, that's it, We're, we've agreed somewhat on a platform, but we can't get consent for that. We can't con get consent for a candidate. So we're going to call the convention over. And they agreed, and this is the one thing they do agree on, we'll try again in six weeks. But as the six weeks approached, it became clear they could not agree on where to actually meet. So what they wound up doing, the Democratic Party, one party, splits into two wings. So you've got Northern Democrats ultimately meeting in Baltimore, Maryland, and nominating Stephen Douglas, while Southern Democrats are going to meet in Charleston, South Carolina, and nominate a man named John Breckinridge, who you see right next to Douglas on the board. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what the his uniform signifies, when the uh, when Lincoln won the election uh, and various states started seceding, John Breckinridge was one of those who joined his home state and seceded, and he wound up being named a general in the Confederate States of America's army. Now, that's the Democratic Party. There were a number of people who didn't feel good in the Democratic Party. There were a few people who were still kind of identifying themselves as know nothings and Whigs, but they just you know, they didn't really have a party anymore. So they, along with the few Democrats who were going, neither one of these guys is acceptable, joined another political party called the Constitutional Union Party, uh, which was uh, which ultimately nominated a guy named John Bell. Uh, now, when I was an undergraduate, I was told that John Bell's candidacy was largely irrelevant. But it's worth pointing out here that John Bell actually won far more uh electoral votes than Stephen Douglas did. Uh, so he was hardly irrelevant to the process. Now, as far as the Republicans go, the Republicans wanted a candidate that they said would attract national support. And Abraham Lincoln certainly fit that bill because throughout the 1850s, he had been arguing in many ways against slavery. He had uh, contested Stephen Douglas's uh, Senate seat in 1858. And ultimately the uh, state legislature in Illinois voted to send Douglas back to the Senate, but it was a very narrow vote, and it had landed landed Lincoln on the national conscience. But 
while they wanted somebody who would attract support, they also wanted someone who hadn't alienated anybody. And Lincoln, it wasn't clear that he was that guy. Now, their first choice was a guy named William Seward. Now, Seward would actually go on to be Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. But there, but Seward was actually the Republicans' first choice. And Seward uh, wound up just kind of poaching that whole thing because he stood up in Congress one day uh, and argued that, quote, a higher law than the Constitution exists. And then he argued that that higher law opposed slavery. So he basically stood on the floor of Congress uh, and opposed slavery and said, uh, God opposes slavery too, and it's a sin. Uh, this branded him as a radical and opened the door for Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln had been born in a log cabin in Kentucky. His family uh, moved to Indiana, where he uh, spent quite a number of years until ultimately moving to Illinois, uh, where Lincoln grew into adulthood and became a prominent lawyer for a railroad company. Again, when I was an undergraduate, the standard uh, the standard discussion about Abraham Lincoln was how he had risen from nothing and was impoverished and somehow became president of the United States. Don't you believe that? Abraham Lincoln looked like that. Abraham Lincoln looked disheveled and looked impoverished. But Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer for a major railroad company, which meant that he was constantly having work. He constantly had business trying to uh, defend the railroad company against uh, against settlers and land disputes and the like. And Lincoln was an, a pretty wealthy guy by the time he was running for the Senate in, in, in Illinois and ultimately uh, the presidency in 1860. Now, he also very well understood the power of, uh, or the appeal of the slave power conspiracy, but he could put it into words in a way that didn't sound like he was crazy, that didn't sound like he just believed in boogeymen and all this sort of stuff. He could speak the language of the Second Great Awakening. And on their third ballot, Abraham Lincoln was nominated for the presidency by the Republican Party. And in 1860, he wins election. Again, I'm going to go back to that slide with the uh, electoral map here. He wins without a single electoral vote from the South. Look at all of these states that he wins. He wins all of these states in the North, in the old Northwest Territory, in the Northeast. He wins Oregon and California, while uh, John Breckinridge and uh, John Bell win the bulk of the South. They're the, they're the guys who are the two biggest challengers to Lincoln, but they don't. The problem for the Democrats is this. Over those intervening years, remember I told you, all of that immigration is going largely to the North. So look at the North's electoral vote totals. New York has 35. Pennsylvania has 27. Ohio has 23. Indiana, 13. Illinois, 11. Look at the vote totals in the South. North Carolina's got 10. South Carolina, 8. Georgia, 10. Texas has 4 electoral votes. So Texas, while this very big state and today has tons of electoral votes, here it's so sparsely populated, it's only got four electoral votes. Okay. Look at the reason I'm pointing these numbers out to you is, is if you look at a state like New York, think about how many states a person would have to win just to counteract New York alone. Okay. So Lincoln's winning all of these states in the North means the South is largely irrelevant to the electoral process. And that's in part why they walk away in 18, excuse me, in 1865, or excuse me, 1861. Now, as he's running for president, Lincoln gives a very stirring speech in New York State. It's, called, it's in Cooper Union, New York. This is why it gets called the Cooper Union Address. And in this Cooper Union address, it lays out Lincoln's ideas and the Republican Party's ideas about all of these rising tensions in the United States. He argued that the South was wrong in arguing that they were committed to the world of the founding fathers. The South had always argued 
that the founding fathers believed the federal government had no authority to interfere in the issues of slavery. But they had determined all along that they could. Lincoln reminded his listeners that the found that the quote founding fathers had always interfered in slavery. They said that it could not be expanded. You all should have read the Northwest Ordinance that was written in 1787 by founding fathers, passed by a Congress made up of quote founding fathers. They had written a constitution in the Constitution of the United States that while it protected the institution, as Lincoln saw it, created a way, a pathway to end the institution, at least to end the importation and thus the expansion of slavery. He demonstrated how time and time again that the founding fathers proposed resolutions, voted in Congress, and in their writings favored interfering in the spread of slavery. So, with all of that in mind, Lincoln is telling everybody, these guys are wrong. But what is he, as a Republican, going to do? Right up until the day South Carolina seceded, Lincoln reminded his listeners and reminded the skeptics that the Republican Party had no desire to interfere with slavery where it existed. Lincoln asserted over and over and over again in the Cooper Union Address and elsewhere that as president, he did not possess the power, nor did Congress possess the power, to end slavery as an institution. The only power that it had was in stopping the expansion of slavery. And remember, Lincoln very strongly disagrees with Roger Taney's ruling in Dred Scott versus Sanford. So right up until that day that he gets elected, Lincoln is arguing, I'm not going to touch slavery as an institution. The only thing I can do is stop the expansion of it. Now for Lincoln, the day his troubles began, was the day he was elected President of the United States, the day his election is certified and he is officially the President-elect. The reason is he's informed of a decision that he needs to deal with right off the bat. Now, remember, Lincoln is President-elect, so he shouldn't be making these decisions, but the President of the United States, James Buchanan, had basically, he had not run for re-election. You didn't see his name on that electoral tote board, if you will. And when Lincoln got elected, Buchanan's position was kind of like, thank God this isn't going to be my problem anymore. And when people would say, Mr. President, what would you like us to do about whatever? Buchanan would go, well, in March, he's going to be president. Why don't you ask him what he wants? So he's just basically saying, I, I got, I'm a short timer. Don't ask me. Now, the decision that Lincoln has to deal with, or the circumstance Lincoln has to deal with, is on December 20th, 1860, in response to Lincoln's official election, South Carolina decided to secede from the United States. And Lincoln has to decide what to do about a military installation in the harbor in Charleston, South Carolina, a a setting called Fort Sumter. Should he leave the troops there? in Fort Sumter, or should he order, through various emissaries and back channels, should he order that they be removed? Lincoln had virtually no clue what to do about this. And when he takes office in March, and he's officially the President of the United States, he sits there going, I don't really know what to do. I'm unclear about what to do. Lincoln truly believed, part of what led Lincoln to drag his feet on on a decision in all of this, was that he truly believed that South Carolinians had been kind of led down a road that they didn't want to go, that it was radicals in South Carolina who favored secession and kind of pushed moderates 
in that direction. But ultimately, Lincoln came to the conclusion that, no, people in South Carolina do, in fact, favor secession. In early 1861, the problem becomes even more acute for Lincoln. Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, and the Arizona Territory, they all secede from the Union. So essentially six more states secede from the Union. Now, Lincoln is looking at this and going, I've got seven states, essentially, that have left. If more states leave, it's an even bigger problem because the states that are talking about leaving that have not left yet are Maryland and Virginia. And Maryland and Virginia surround Washington, D.C. So Lincoln is convinced if something happens that pushes Maryland and Virginia out, we're in real trouble, and I cannot let that happen. So Lincoln indicates, I am willing to negotiate. I am willing to seek a compromise here. And the compromise is this. He says he will remove the troops from Fort Sumter if South Carolina will rescind secession, meaning if they'll go, okay, we're tearing it up, we're staying. Now, that would also prompt these other states to rescind their secession, and it would keep Maryland and Virginia from seceding. So he says, I'll do, I'll remove the troops if you just rescind secession. South Carolina tells him, forget it, we're not doing it. Lincoln proposes, there's only 12 amendments to the U.S. Constitution at this time. Lincoln says, I will personally propose to Congress a 13th Amendment that, if adopted, would protect slavery everywhere. It would literally say, in so many words, the president cannot end slavery. So you don't have to worry about, quote, me ending slavery. I'll be constitutionally forbidden from doing that. Again, if you just rescind secession. South Carolina says, "Mm -mm, not doing it. He offers one last bit. Remember, the Republican Party's platform was about stopping the spread of slavery into the territories. Lincoln says, fine, this is the last best offer I've got. If you rescind secession, I will allow the expansion of slavery into the New Mexico Territory. That means the Republican Party's platform ceases to exist. Lincoln will have thrown it all out to keep the Union together. However, the South indicates they are not willing to negotiate. South Carolina says, nope, we're not doing it. The other states indicate, nope, we're behind South Carolina. And so Lincoln announces that Fort Sumter will be resupplied. Now he announces with food only, it's actually food and medical supplies, but it will be resupplied with food only. There will be no military equipment being sent, no armaments, no cannon, no artillery, no ammunition, nothing. It's food. That's it. And he announces this publicly, but in response to this announcement, the hastily organized Confederate States of America orders the bombardment of Fort Sumter, and U.S. forces at Fort Sumter surrender after 48 hours. Now, the person who literally fires the first official shot of the, of the Civil War is the guy pictured on the board here, Edmund Ruffin. Now, that's not Edmund Ruffin years and years after the Civil War. That's Edmund Ruffin on the eve of the Civil War. He was 61 years of age. He had been a supporter of secession dating back to the nullification crisis when he was in his uh, early 30s. When the South, when South Carolina finally did secede, he made it his personal mission to fire the first shot on the North. And he joined the South Carolina militia, trained with them, did all the things that they were trying to do uh, to get ready. 
even though he's 61 years of age. He wants he wants to do this. And finally, when the bombardment is ordered, Ruffin is allowed to strike the match, put it to the cannon, and fire the first cannon shot. Uh, because he was 61 years of age, uh, the commander of these mili- this militia force uh, basically came to him afterward and said, uh, you look a little tired. Would you like to retire? And effectively, Ruffin went, oh, yeah, thank God. Thank God I can retire now. So he retired from the South Carolina militia, knowing that he had fired the first shot of the Civil War. Uh, unfortunately, Edmund Ruffin does not have, his story does not have a good ending. Uh, when the Confederate forces surrendered at Appomattox uh, in April of 1865, Ruffin wrapped himself up in the flag of the Confederacy and then blew his brains out, saying that he would rather die than live in the United States again, rather than live in a reconstructed post-Civil War United States. Now, he doesn't use those words, but that's the uh, that's the ethos uh, the pathos of his of his uh, suicide letter. Now, why do this? Why launch this preemptive strike? That's what it is in every way. It's a preemptive strike. The reason they did this was a fear that they were losing support. South Carolina had had incredibly high support for secession, but Texas was very much a divided place. Uh, for example, Sam Houston uh, had come out very strongly against secession and felt that he had no choice but to leave Texas uh, because of his support uh, for Union. Uh, so there's that. There's the two sides, Texas and South Carolina, on opposite ends of this. Uh, but the South truly believed, the Confederacy truly believed, that by striking first, it would unify Southerners and bring fence-sitters like Maryland and Virginia in to the Confederacy. And they were right. It did. It brought in a lot of fence sitters. But in the long run, the preemptive war turned out to be a mistake, just like Japan attacking Pearl Harbor during World War II turned out to be a mistake. The preemptive strike unified Northerners this time. Now, in comparison, we're going to use this as our comparative to John Brown's raid. John Brown's raid unified Southerners and convinced them that compromise was not possible. This attack on Fort Sumter convinced Northerners that the slave power, quote unquote, would stop at nothing and compromise simply was no longer possible. Now we're going to take a quick detour here and discuss why Southern states seceded. There have been a lot of explanations offered about why Southern states seceded prior to the Civil War. For example, tariffs are frequently cited, uh, the issue of states' rights, the differences in economics that, you know, the North was a free labor-dependent system while Southern, the South was a slave labor-dependent system, and one of those systems had to go, and thus this was a war of Northern economic aggression. That Southerners truly believed that their local interests, that their ability to maintain control at the local level was being usurped by the national government and that what they were trying to do was keep the national government out of their business. There's one thing, though, in all of this stuff, and even if we uh, were to take each one of these issues and break them down, each one of them inevitably comes back to that one issue that's not mentioned. And that one issue that's not mentioned is the issue of slavery. And I want you to all understand this. There is one undebatable, unalterable, crucial fact about American history. This is not my opinion. This is not something that's, well, based on my readings, I have concluded that. This is a fact. The South seceded to preserve and protect slavery. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to listen to me. Listen to the Confederates themselves. This is Mississippi's resolution of secession. Quote, The people of the northern states have assumed a revolutionary position toward the southern states. They have interfered with slavery as it prevails in the slaveholding states. They have enticed our slaves from us. They continue their system of agitation, 
obviously for the purpose of encouraging other slaves to escape from service. They claim the right to exclude slavery from the territories. They thus seek by an increase of abolition states to acquire two-thirds of both houses for the purpose of preparing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, abolishing slavery in the states. They have elected a president and vice president on the ground that there exists an irreconcilable conflict between the two sections of the Confederacy. In this context, the Confederacy means the United States of America. Thus declaring that the powers of this government are to be used for the dishonor and overthrow of the southern section of this great Confederacy. That's Mississippi. Listen, again, just listen to South Carolina's declaration of secession. The 14 northern free states have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted the open establishment among them of societies whose avowed object is to disturb the peace of and elowing the property of citizens of other states. Uh, there's an, uh, there's a, uh, a definition of elowing in, uh, in, uh, in the board here, so I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, they have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes, and those who remain have been uh, incited by emissaries, books, and pictures to servile insurrection. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He has declared that the government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. The Republican Party has announced that the South shall be excluded from the common territory, that the judicial tribunal shall be made sectional, and that a war must be waged against slavery until it shall cease throughout the United States. Now, 11 states seceded. 11 states wrote declarations of secession. And I could, I'm not going to, but I could drive you insane by reading all 11 of them. I'm not going to. I read you two representative ones here. Do those things, do those ordinances or uh, statements or secession uh, orders say a word about tariffs? And the answer is no. They don't say a word about states' rights. And even if they had said, we're doing this because of our state's rights to uphold our control. It's about the state's right to have slaves or not have slaves. Every single secession ordinance, resolution, declaration discussed one issue and one issue alone. Slavery. Period. Now, even if you don't want to, even if I haven't convinced you, if you don't want to listen to them, how about let's listen to the words of the vice president and the, quote, Thomas Jefferson, if you will, of the Confederate States of America, a guy named Alexander Stevens. Alexander Stevens was a philosopher. Uh, he was uh, he was a, a small time planter. He was a plantation owner, uh, but not a large plantation necessarily. Uh, and he really was not uh, too much uh, into uh, physical vigor. His thought, his idea was that he could do much greater uh, benefit to the Confederacy as a sort of philosophical leader, which is why I say he's the Jefferson, if you will, of the Confederate States. But listen to what he said. He becomes vice president of the Confederacy, and listen to what he writes in the or says in the so-called quote cornerstone speech. He says the following quote: "The Confederate Constitution." has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institutions, African slavery, as it exists among us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. So he's saying right off the bat, in the first words of this, the cause of the late rupture and present revolution was the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization, as he says, as he puts it. He continues, The prevailing ideas entertained by Jefferson and most of the leading statesmen 
at the time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically wrong. These ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. Our new government, the Confederate States of America, our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and moral condition. Stevens continues, this, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. To use modern parlance, this is what we call a mic drop moment. Okay, There's no debate about what caused the Civil War. The people in the moment knew what caused it. So the war comes. Civil War comes, and it is brutal. At the Battle of Antietam, one of the most famous battles of the Civil War, more Americans died during that one battle than during the War of 1812. And the numbers are on the board here. More people died at Antietam than during the War of 1812, the War with Mexico, the Spanish-American War, and both Gulf Wars combined. In this Civil War, more Americans died than in all of our other wars combined, except World War II. That's why you don't see World War II on this board. If we threw World War II on this board, those other wars barely edge out the Civil War. So this is an incredibly deadly war. It's also the United States' first modern war. The U.S.'s, not the world's, the U.S.'s first modern war. Never before in American history had such large armies faced each other using uh, industrial weapon, industrial age technology. It was also what we call a total war, meaning that the entirety of one society is pitted against the entirety of the other society. There's no distinction in a total war between civilian and soldier. So it also sets a precedent for 20th century wars as well. And this war, make no mistake about it, is not just important for the United States. As I've said over and over and over again, American history does not happen in a vacuum. Northern victory and thus the triumph of free labor forced Great Britain to give the vote to the working class there. It led directly to the toppling of empires in Mexico and France again. It led the Tsar of Russia to amass his coerced labor, the serfs in Russia. And finally, it leads to the end of slavery, ultimately, in Cuba and Brazil. Now, had the South won, and that certainly could have happened, then conservatism would have been strengthened worldwide. And who knows whether these things would have happened as they did. Now, both sides, the North and the South, were convinced that this war was, would be a short war. They were convinced that there would be a few battles, and then ultimately there would be a compromised settlement. Now, the North was incredibly confident. They believed that the South would immediately ask for peace because they looked at their numbers and agreed with the pronouncement of Napoleon Bonaparte that, quote, God is on the side of the largest battalions. So if we just kind of, again, use a look at this as a tale of the tape, the North had 22 million people in total population, while the South had 9 million in total population. However, of those 9 million, 3 million were enslaved. And the South looked at their slave population and said, they are not fit for service. They will not be able to fight in the Civil War. The North, at the start of the war, had three times as many soldiers. However, as we're going to see, uh, that is kind of a, uh, an illusory uh, uh, advantage. The North had 453 railroad locomotives, the engines that pull trains. The South had just built their first 17. 97% of all firearms were manufactured 
in the north. Arsenals, the buildings where weapons are stored. Northern arsenals had one million weapons stored. Southern arsenals had 100,000 weapons that were stored. Uh, and most of those firearms were uh, War of 1812 era firearms, which meant that they were incredibly old and outdated from a technological standpoint. Northern steel mills produced 20 times as much steel as Southern steel mills did. Northerners produced 500 times as many tools as Southerners did, uh, which meant that they could replace items, they could fix items easier. Um, even in terms of agriculture, while a lot of people said, well, the South clearly had an advantage in agriculture, uh, uh, that just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. There was one county in upstate New York that actually outproduced all of the South combined from an agricultural standpoint. So this was not, if we look at just this sort of tail of the tape, uh, it looks like the North has a very easy uh an easy victory on their side. Uh, but that is, it would be wrong to assume, as one fairly famous historian did, it would be wrong to assume that if the North wanted to win this war, all they had to do was take their other arm from out behind their back. That's absurd. The South absolutely had advantages, and they could have won the Civil War. First of all, they don't have to conquer anything. The North has to do all of the conquering. Okay, South doesn't have to conquer anything. They just need to, quote, stay alive. And that's going to be a big deal, just like it was during the Revolutionary War. All the Revolutionary Army, the Continental Army, had to do was stay alive, and they're, they'll win. Because remember, just like we said during the Revolutionary War, the British have to come in, and conquer the Americas, the American colonies, to stamp out revolutionary sentiment. Same thing here. Northern states, the Union Army, has to go to the South and conquer them and stamp out Confederate sentiment, or else the Confederacy, quote, wins. The longer they can hold out, the better their chances are of winning. Now, the United States Army did have 16,000 men, and as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority of those were from the North. But it is only 16,000 men. The United States' army was authorized at 25,000 men. 25,000 men was the size of the army right after the War of 1812 was over. So the United States had gotten exponentially bigger, had fought in a major overseas war, and maintained the exact same size military. So this was not that big of an advantage. On top of that, the United States War Department, that which oversees the Army, had engaged in no preparation whatsoever. There were no maps of the Confederacy, for example. They had no analyses of how many troops the Confederates would need uh, in order to win. They had no analyses of how many troops the United States would need to put down a rebellion. And why I'm pointing this out, why this is such a big problem, think about how many times we've talked about secession in this class. The first time the South talks about seceding is in 1819 over the Missouri crisis. They talk about secession again in 1831 during the nullification crisis. I only mentioned it in passing, but they talked about secession again in 1850 at the Nashville Convention. And then they finally do secede in 1861. So four times in 40 years, the South had talked secession and the United States' Department of War, the body that exists to prepare for what if They'd taken that threat and gone, eh, probably not going to happen. So no preparation whatsoever. No maps of the South. No, uh, no preparation for the officer corps. The officer corps was overwhelmingly Southern. And when Southern states seceded, those Southern generals resigned their commissions and went off to fight on the Confederate side. Uh, so the United States does not have a very solid 
officer corps, with a, with one very notable exception. Uh, but it's, again, an odd exception. The U.S.'s highest-ranking officer, and clearly their best strategic mind, was a guy named Winfield Scott. And make no mistake about it, he was top-notch in terms of strategy. He uh, His ideas for how the United States would win the Civil War ultimately formed the basis of what uh, Ulysses S. Grant is going to call the raiding strategy. So Scott comes up with the right idea. But Winfield Scott is not going to lead troops into the field. If Winfield Scott's name sounds familiar to you, he was the same Winfield Scott that landed troops uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and marched across Mexico during the war with Mexico. But by now, in 1861, he's 74 years old. He weighs more than 300 pounds. He could not mount a horse without the help of a specially built flight of stairs that he had to walk up to and then kind of slide over onto the horse. So there's no chance that he's actually going to lead men into battle. But again, while he had physically deteriorated, mentally he had the he had by far the best mind of anybody in the United States military. And as far as who would wind up taking control of U.S. forces, that being Ulysses S. Grant, who is generally considered the best general of the Civil War era, Ulysses S. Grant, at the start of this war, he's a drunken store clerk in Illinois. He worked for his father in a dry goods store and was widely known as the town drunk. So nobody thought uh, Ulysses S. Grant was going to be what he was. All sides wound up being in it for a very long, drawn-out war. With all of the North's advantages, they had no idea that the South could or would industrialize as quickly as it did. The South does. They indust- it, it is a marvel how quickly they advance. They produce so much from an industrial output standpoint that they never lose a battle because of a lack of bullets or because of a lack of manufactured equipment, like, you know, they don't have weapons or they don't have uh, uniforms or they don't have ammunition. They lose because they ran out of food. They had flip-flopped their society so much that they were ignoring the agricultural side of it. Now, this war, as I mentioned, is the most violent war in American history. And there's two reasons for this, this level of violence. One is the use of outmoded military tactics. Outmoded military tactics like linear warfare, remember the idea that two lines of soldiers are approaching each other on a battlefield and they're going to seek the most advantageous strategic position and with the hope that if one clearly has the strategic advantage, the other side will go, well, they've won, so let's go. Let's leave. That tactic worked early in warfare in the United States. It's based on the idea, as I've mentioned, on massive frontal assaults. It had always worked before because the weaponry the United States had used was not terribly deadly. It could kill a person, sure, from close range, but the idea of laying fire down was to lay cover fire so that groups could advance toward one another. Now, the second reason, and these two are absolutely linked, is the use of revolutionary technology, revolutionary weaponry, specifically the Industrial Revolution. Before the Civil War, armies fought with what are called smoothbore muskets. Those smoothbore muskets are noted on the left-hand side here. Okay, You'll note that there's no grooves or notches cut in to that, that musket's barrel. So when, it's, when a lead ball is loaded down into that musket barrel, and it's loaded down with cotton wadding, it has to be packed very tightly so that that lead ball doesn't move around. And then when it's actually fired, the ball, the lead ball, just kind of ping-pongs up the barrel. Now, on by contrast, what happened in the interim between the uh, war with Mexico and the Civil War is that arms manufacturers started putting grooves in the barrel. Now, this was a technology that had already existed. The United States Army, however, thought it was too expensive and wasteful to do this sort of thing. But now 
It's standard in the United States military's weapons. So now, if a person were to fire a lead ball, if they pack a lead ball down and it gets packed in tightly and it gets fired, that ball will will pick up these grooves and come out spinning at a much faster rate. And because it's spinning much faster, because it's got more force behind it, it has more killing power or more stopping power. Now, on top of that advantage, using the rifles, the rifling, arms manufacturers were also making, uh, making projectiles that would actually make sense in these new rifled muskets. For example, the mini ball, which had what's called a concave back, meaning it's just kind of hollow at the back, so that when the weapon got fired, this part here, you see on the bottom, it's going to melt and expand out, and the flanges will actually grip the rifling so that it comes out even faster and comes out with even more force than a traditional just kind of round ball that's coming out of there. So these were even more deadly than just a, a, a lead ball coming out. So when you line up these two lines of soldiers now in linear warfare, what you're doing is basically lining these guys up to get mowed down. Both sides are going to suffer insanely high amounts of casualties. So this is in part why these this war is so deadly. The weapons they're using and the tactics they're using are designed in such a way that they're just going to get people killed in absurd numbers. Now, the Civil War is also the first war in the United States' history that uses uh, telegraphs, that uses railroads to a great extent to move man and equipment. They're going to use helium balloons so that they can, uh, so that armies can figure out what the best strategic positions are. Uh, they're going to use telegraphs to talk about moving uh, troops and to uh, pass messages along. Even the first forms of hand grenades are going to be used during the Civil War. Now, some battle plans were well conceived, others less so. One battle, for example, called the Battle of the Crater, turned on an idea by a northern commander that was just really not well thought out. He noted where the Confederate troops had taken up position and believed that he could actually create a tunnel underneath to where they were. So he hires a group of miners to dig a tunnel underneath them and plans to detonate dynamite under where the Confederate soldiers were. It worked, but it also killed a ton of Union Army troops who had not had advance notice that this guy was planning to do this. So they continued to advance on the Confederate position. The dynamite gets detonated. The crater gets created, killing lots of Confederates, killing lots of Northerners. Oh, and by the way, it kills the miners too. So this was incredibly ill-conceived. Um, but this northern, uh, this northern, northern commander is not the only person with this incredible will to kill. Uh, I'm going to give you a sort of warning uh, that this image you're going to see on the next slide uh, is pretty graphic. So if you need to turn away, uh, feel free to turn away and just listen to me talk here for a couple of minutes. The will to kill on both sides was unbelievable. Uh, Confederate women frequently wore necklaces that were made out of the teeth of Union Army soldiers. Uh, when uh, Confederates killed Union Army soldiers, they would almost always go onto the battlefield and pull teeth uh, to send home as a sort of sort of garish uh, charm necklace of sorts. Uh, the Confederates had a prison called Andersonville where the Union soldiers who were uh, prisoners of war that got assigned to that prison uh, were frequently starved to death. The guy that you see on the board is actually a survivor from Andersonville. Uh, he was not a cadaver. This is a person who lived through Andersonville. Uh, the Confederates also adopted a policy after the Union Army allowed African-American enlistments. The Confederates adopted a policy called No Quarter when it came to black soldiers, meaning that if they captured black soldiers, they were going to kill those soldiers. This no quarter policy only stopped when Abraham Lincoln announced that for every black soldier killed, that the Union armies would execute a Confederate soldier. 
The Civil War also represented a public health crisis. Uh, by the way, if any of you turned away, you can now turn back because I've flipped the slide here. Uh, the Civil War also represented a public health crisis. Uh, these soldiers had very little ideas about sanitation, about pure water, about how germs spread. Uh, units during the Civil War frequently lost half of their troop strength due to disease, not enemy bullets. Now, for the first 17 months of the war, the war is actually about preservation of the Union. Now, do not mistake that. Don't think that I'm walking back what I said just a few minutes ago. What had torn the Union apart was the institution of slavery. This is why the South seceded. But Abraham Lincoln stated publicly over and over again that what he wanted was to bring the South back into the Union, not to end slavery. Abraham Lincoln had couldn't uh, uh, basically said if he tried to end slavery, he would lose those so-called border states. He once said, uh, or supposedly said, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky because of the importance that Kentucky had to controlling the Mississippi River, uh, because of the, uh, the uh, large number of pro-Union people that were in Kentucky. Uh, in those four border states uh, that I identified earlier, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and Tennessee, in those four states, there were two and a half million whites and about 500,000 slaves. Lincoln knew that if he said, I'm doing this to end slavery, that those border states would secede. And this wasn't just sort of a guess on Lincoln's part. The Confederacy always, the Confederate states always assumed that those four states would come along because when they made their initial Confederate battle flag, the Confederate battle flag contained 15 stars, thinking that Kentucky, Tennessee, Maryland, and Delaware would come along. They didn't, but that was the assumption. During the war, Lincoln also moved to suppress civil liberties. For example, in Maryland, to make sure that they didn't vote to secede, he arrested pro-Confederate legislators, held them without trial or without indictment. He suspended the, writ, the process of habeas corpus, the right of a person to review their imprisonment. All of these things were done as wartime necessity, as Lincoln's supporters described them. So Lincoln is absolutely treating this war in a, in a very big way in these early periods, as if this is just a domestic insurrection and this is all about bringing the South back in. But the first part of this war, the first several months, were essentially a stalemate. Nobody gets an advantage. The Union wins some battles, the Confederates win some battles, but nobody has an advantage. Now, as this is going on, Lincoln tried again to negotiate with the border states to end slavery. He said, why don't we end slavery here with compensation to the slave owners? And again, they said no, making it pretty clear that slavery needs to be kind of on the back burner as a cause. But by the summer of 1862, Lincoln was starting to get desperate. So many soldiers had signed up for 90-day enlistments, then they'd kind of been coerced into signing new 90-day enlistments. And many a lot, many of the original enlistees were starting to run out of time. They were literally calling themselves, quote-unquote, Ohio brigades. They were over the hill in October, as they said. So Lincoln concluded that with this fear that he's going to lose manpower, with the fear that there's nothing tangible to fight for, Lincoln starts thinking, I've got to do something desperate, and that something desperate is to make this a war on the property of Confederates. We're going to turn this into a war against slavery. So stalemate, a need for troops, and a need for a moral cause played a role in the transition to a war against slavery. Now, Lincoln thought right off the bat that enslaved peoples would form an enemy within as as regards the confederacy that they would naturally oppose enslaved people would naturally oppose the confederates but another thought that was guiding him here was that he's just taking advantage of a re reality that's happening on the battlefield 
as northern forces, as Union forces approached areas in the south, areas where there were large concentrations of slaves, enslaved people would run away to Union army lines, saying, we're here, save us. Now, at first, Lincoln's orders and the orders from the War Department were that Union army commanders must obey the law of the land, which was the Fugitive Slave Act. And as crazy as this sounds, Southerners could come walking into Union army camps with a white flag signaling that they are not there to fight and say, excuse me, you have my slaves. Here's my paperwork to prove it. I'll be taking them home with me. And a lot of commanders were going, this sucks. This doesn't make sense because we know that they are using those slaves against us. So how do we figure out, how do we get around this? How do we get around the law? And it became pretty, to, to one union officer, he said, this is simple. Let's declare them contraband. If we captured, it's turning their idea about property on its head. Remember, Southerners were always saying enslaved people are property, just like livestock, just like furniture, just like whatever. And this Union commander said, if we found a crate of weapons, that's property. But because it could be used to harm us, we would declare it contraband and thus say we don't have to give it back. So why don't we simply declare enslaved people to similarly be, quote, contraband? And the War Department was run by a lawyer named Edwin Stanton. And Edwin Stanton said, hey, I like that idea. It holds up. He presents it to Lincoln, who very famously was a lawyer, who effectively said, hey, I like that idea. It holds up. Let's do it. So they start declaring these enslaved people to be contraband and saying we're not sending these people back. These former slaves began attending schools, began working for the United States Army in support roles, but their status, this is a problem here that the United States Army faces and that the United States is, as a whole is going to face, is that these people's status is entirely unclear. While they have been declared contraband, what happens when the war is over? Do they go back to slavery? Are they actually free or, or just what? Now, as Lincoln is thinking about all of this stuff, he's desperate to come up with a solution to turn the war into a war that would end slavery, but also to make sure that the United States doesn't change very much. Uh, and to that end, uh, Lincoln, also, Lincoln, before he issues an Emancipation Proclamation, says, why don't we try colonization one more time? He takes a group of emancipated former slaves, puts them on boats, and sends them to Haiti, thinking Haiti is a former slave republic. This will be a perfect place for them to go. But the ship sank en route. Most of those who were heading to Haiti uh, died en route. And when they got there, those who didn't die en route died fairly quickly, courtesy of disease. So Lincoln finally abandoned that plan and concluded that only, quote unquote, a proclamation of freedom or an emancipation proclamation will work. But he also was smart. He knew if the United States appeared to be losing the war, that it would, it would just look desperate. It wouldn't actually work. That people would go, well, he's desperate. So he needs a victory to be doing this from a position of strength. He needs a victory. And he gets that victory, sort of, at a battle called the Battle of Antietam. Now, why I say it's a weird battle, why he got it, quote, sort of, is because the Battle of Antietam technically was a draw. From a tactical and strategic standpoint, it was a draw. Robert E. Lee was the commander of Confederate forces at Appomattox, and they went into Maryland. They got within striking distance of Washington, D.C. It was really, really close. And Lincoln had this massive army there poised to stop Lee. But his commander, a guy named George McClellan, 
was simply going, I, you know what? I don't know if now is the right time to take the battlefield. I think Lee has more forces than he says he does. He, uh, McClellan also at one point said that Lee had three times as many soldiers as, as he actually did and said, I can't do it. And Lincoln got so frustrated that he said, if you're not intending to use the army, will you please allow me to use my army? Uh, so ultimately, uh, George McClellan came to the conclusion he's got to move against Robert E. Lee. But what made him actually move was that when Lee is preparing for the battle, as he's getting this close, he had sent all of his subordinates a copy of the battle plan. And one of those subordinates, a guy named D.H. Hill, accidentally got two copies of his orders. Now, he got two copies. One, he preserved carefully in his book of orders, which he was required to do. The second one, though, the second piece, the second piece of paper, he looked at and said, well, I got an extra piece of paper here. What do I do with it? And he concluded he had some cigars and cigars were made in, a, in such a way then that they came out of the process incredibly oily. And you don't want to put something like that next to your shirt or your uniform because it'll get your uniform or your short all, all oily. So you wrap them up. You wrap those cigars up in a piece of paper. You just kind of just roll them all, all together so that you got them kind of held together by that piece of paper. And then you can reach in and draw a cigar out when you need it. But it's protecting your clothing. Somewhere along the march, Hill leaned over. The orders fell out of his pocket. A Union Army sergeant found them. He found the cigar. He was way more excited about the cigars. But he also realized very quickly what he had and went rushing to George McClellan uh, through his superiors. And George McClellan says, well, now that I've got a copy of the battle plans, I can, I can move against Lee. Now, as it turns out, McClellan still moved slowly. He did not defeat Lee. In many ways, uh, Lee ex exacted a ton of casualties, took a lot of troop strength from McClellan. But Lee also looked at the situation and said, well, we're running out of food and ammunition today, so better for us to withdraw from the field and resupply and start over again. By doing that, Lee allowed McClellan to be able to claim well, they abandoned the battlefield, so I must have won. And that was good enough for Lincoln. As Lincoln saw it, it's good enough. I'll take it, he says. And Lincoln issues, what came after the Battle of Appomattox, Lincoln issues a preliminary emancipation proclamation. It is issued in September of 1862 to take effect in January of 1863, January 1st, 1863, to be precise. It states as follows. Number one, all slaves in Confederate controlled territory only are forever free. As of January 1st, 1863, they are, quote, forever free. There's also a provision down the line in it that allows African Americans to enlist in the Union Army. Now, he follows this, um, uh, the, uh, the early emancipation proclamation, the preliminary, with something called the Militia Act of 1862, which describes how those men, how those uh, former slaves can actually uh, enlist in the army. But what's striking about this is that it specifically exempts slaves in Union-controlled territory. Again, the Emancipation Proclamation is a document you've all been asked to read, and it's important to note that it frees slaves only in Confederate-controlled territory while exempting enslaved people in Northern or Union-controlled territory. So what do we make of this Emancipation Proclamation? Many historians for a very long time said the Emancipation Proclamation is basically meaningless because it freed enslaved people that Lincoln was in no position to free the South, and it left it intact in a place where Lincoln was actually in a position to free them. Modern historians, more modern historians, however, argue that, yeah, that's true. There's no denying this. But 
the Emancipation Proclamation is important because it unequivocally declares that the Civil War is about the end of slavery. Slaves in the South knew exactly what this meant, that a Union victory meant freedom, that those in Union-controlled territory knew also. Given that Lincoln had said the nation cannot endure permanently half slave and half free, he knew that once the Civil War is over, slavery itself is over. So the Emancipation Proclamation is important from that declaration, from the point, standpoint of that declaration alone. We'll see how this all plays out in our next lecture, Lecture 19, The End of the Civil War and Reconstruction, which is our dun -da 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 -dun, our last lecture of the semester. So see you then.